Hello and welcome back to the TNC podcast. We're doing this podcast uh, just remotely because the coronavirus is still a thing, sadly, so we have to stay away from each other. But I'm delighted to be able to welcome Mr. Benjamin Bloom to the show today. Uh, we were just chatting off camera. The last time that me and Ben spoke on camera was before the Leeds United won Norwich City 3 game. And we'll get on to that in a little while. But it's been a long while since we spoke on camera. And I think... You might not want to admit it, but you're everyone's favourite Ipswich fan in, 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 in NR1. Uh, I've had loads of Twitter questions that we'll get onto a bit kind of um, going on to that. So it's, it's an absolute delight to have you back on, mate. First of all, how are you? I'm just bored, Jack. I was so <laughs> pleased when you DM'd me earlier. It was like, yes, let's talk some football for an hour or so. But in all seriousness, um, I work in education. My missus works in education. So we're absolutely fine. We've got food. We've got shelter and we've been paid. We've been paid our April salary. I don't know how it's going to yeah. go going forward. But no, I was thinking as well. So so weird. Um, the last time we spoke, like you say, in a hotel before, yeah. Nor- before Norwich Leeds. And we still didn't know at that point whether you were the real deal or not. And then that performance and that night was just, okay, yeah. right, we get, I mean, we get it now, yeah. Yeah, people, you know, it's the classic question, what's your favourite ever away day? And I'm sure you look back, you know, down the, down the times of Ipswich and you can pick out like one or two. That for me, that night was so special because Leeds were, were arguably the best squad in that in that division at the time, they had Bielsa. I was watching the, the Leeds documentary actually over the past few days, when he just got round to it. There was so much hope surrounding that club at the time. And we went there, you were there, and we absolutely walked apart with them. It was it was one of the most complete performances since I think we played Middlesbrough at Wembley in the, in the playoff final. So can you remember that night vividly? Can you remember what it was like sitting there? Well, I... I remember the yeah, I remember the surprise of it. Um, obviously, I was outside from Ipswich lost in the last minute at home to Sheffield Wednesday, just before the game. Typically, so I'm going back and forth, and as you can imagine, my you know I, I get praised for being balanced, but you can imagine the podcast I host, the WhatsApp group. It's all <laughs> it was all right. Tonight's the night. Norwich are getting Norwich are getting found out. You know mm. this is and. Everyone was watching on Sky. And I remember saying to Chris Gorham in a thing I did at the end of the season, that wasn't only the best Norwich performance I saw um, last night. It was the best performance I saw. Uh, maybe I saw Leeds derby after Spygate and mm. Leeds were incredible. But yeah. um, Norwich were absolutely brilliant. And they just tweaked the tactics slightly and just sat off a little bit. And I hadn't seen Buendia up to that point either. And... Oh God! Yeah, it was unbelievable, wasn't it? Hell of a performance, and yeah, it could have been. Um, I watched back a like ten-minute clip of that. That could have been five-nil that game. Yeah, easily. It was such a peculiar game because the the Pookie goal, everyone thought it was offside, so no one celebrated, and then no Miles flag offside, went up. wasn't he? Yeah, it was really odd though. But from the, where the angle we were, he looked a mile offside. Then Leeds started playing this weird white noise over the speakers when we were through on goal. Yeah, yeah. It was just a really kind of peculiar night, but. Jack, do you remember oh. in the second half? Sorry to interrupt. I think mm. was it Lewis or Aaron's clean through and missed one, and I think yeah. Pookie actually his only miss of the season. I think <laughs> I think Pookie missed one. It genuinely could have been um, five nil. And I think I just think in you talking about the Leeds documentary, I think Ellen Road is like Leeds' biggest strength and their biggest weakness. When yeah, someone turns big. up and raises their game, and that dynamic shifts around on Leeds. It's, it's hard for them to play there sometimes. And that happened in May later when I was there with Derby County as well. Definitely. I mean, we'll probably be back there soon in terms of the championship. But them nights under the lights, big occasions. I don't think you can quite beat it. It's certainly for a club like Norwich in the Premier League, you don't get them kind of occasions anymore. So, uh, yeah, I look back very fondly at that night. We also filmed the podcast on the morning of that game. And we spoke in depth about a certain Paul Lambert. Now, he'd joined... I didn't realise quite how early on in that season it was. You said it was about October, it wasn't was it? Late, o- late October. Um, I think possibly just before an international break. OK, so Paul Hurst about that. had been sacked. You were in a fairly perilous position at that point. But the hope that Paul Lambert was going to come in, maybe not get you out of where you were at that point, but at least start playing some nice football... 
Um, and even if you were to drop into League One, which of course did eventually happen, you would then come straight back up. What has happened, one at Ipswich and two with Paul Lambert since that time that we last spoke over a year ago? Well, it's, it's so interesting to actually be speaking to you about it because I remember we were chit-chatting and you said, oh, Ben, by the way, I've just done something with Gary Carzer. It's coming out. Have a listen to it. So um, you were all gung-ho with this narrative. Oh, you know, was Lambert the front man for this? Was it the was it the work of the whole team with Ian Culverhouse? And, and I remember very sarcastically answering you back saying, Where's Ian Culverhouse now, Jack? And he yeah. said, oh, he's, he's manager of Kings Lynn or what have you. Um, so... And got promoted that season, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tremendous ego. Um, so you, um, you were already saying this is not the same Paul Lambert that was, um, you know, did that amazing job to do the two promotions at Norwich. And I was saying to you before we started that, um, someone had tweeted the Simeon Jackson goal to get you guys promoted at Pompey in uh, 2010, I think. And they yes. cut to Lambert on the touchline. He looks so focused, so in control. You mm. know, he's just got his second successive promotion. And yeah, he just doesn't seem, he doesn't seem the same guy. In terms of what's gone wrong, I mean, he, he's a bit unfairly called PR Paul by some <laughs> <laughs> some sets of Ipswich fans now. Um, he did a brilliant job um, in with with Mick, where it got fractures between the fans and the management. He did a brilliant job. Some might say he he sucked up to the fans, etc. He made the right noises. He did a brilliant job getting everything kind of happy mm. and whatnot. But you know as well as I do that that only lasts so long. Well. You're not well. You're not winning games. Um, yeah. We, do you know what? We started off. We playing this sort of four-three-three type things, and he he tried. You'll laugh. He tried to split the centre backs and drop a midfielder in, um, and it looked really good. And a lot of us are kind of disappointed that even if relegation was going to be a thing, that he didn't just stick with the plan. Stick with the plan. Yeah. If anyone knows about sticking with the plan, it's Norwich fans because mm. you waited and waited and waited and waited, and then. You played Middlesbrough in September last year. Pookie went up front. Rhodes got mm. taken out of the team. Zimmerman came back. And it just needed that last thing to click. Um, yeah. So he's tried He's tried lots of different things. <laughs> Literally every formation, every permutation you can imagine. There was a sense last year that the terrible, terrible recruitment that had happened with Webster and Waghorn going out and then Hurst dropping Bielkowski, who's now... <laughs> brilliant in the championship yeah. game for Millwall yeah um, there was a sense that he got a pass because of the terrible recruitment fast forward to this season and there's a bit of a sense in, in League One that you get a few months grace while teams are sorting themselves out etc yeah. and there was a bit of a sense that we had a squad of kind of lower level championship upper level League One players and I just remember going to a game in September against Shrewsbury and Jack I watch a lot of games and I've Dude, seen yeah. a lot of good football teams and we won 3-0 and I went on my Blue Monday podcast and said I don't get it I don't we're not good no, I did <laughs> not no seriously I did not okay. see a pattern of play I saw Flynn Downs who looked really good and the two forwards kind of took their chances and uh, Shrewsbury had Steve Morrison playing for him actually and okay. had a guy sent off and it was just strange. I was like, where is the pattern of play? Where, Where is this going? What is the system? Are we counter-attack? I don't get it. And yeah. lo and behold, I hate to say I was right, Jack, and maybe you were right as well in respects of um, whether Lambert's old-school manager style of motivating and putting a team together and here we go yeah. works anymore. Um but yeah, they're they're not. I'm sure Norwich fans will be disgusted to hear. Then they're, they're not going to get promoted. Um, no. You know what? Come what may. There's just. Um, I just don't see. I don't see what what the plan is. And nowadays, you you need that, don't you? You really need. Where are we going with this? And what's the plan? So, I hate to say, um, you were probably closer to the mark in our last conversation than I was. Ever the optimistic fan, but not gone well at all. Yeah, I mean, it's easy to sit back now and say, I'm not going to say I was right. I think most Norwich fans looked, and we we were saying it out more out of hope than knowledge. We were, 
But we'd also seen him fail at Stoke, at Aston Villa, blah, blah, blah. I know you can take positives out of all the jobs he's had, but he was never quite the same since, since, he, since he left Culverhouse and Carza. But the start of this League One campaign, you started very well. And there was a point where I think we were bottom, as we have been for the majority of the season. You were top, or certainly in the top two or three. And it was looking like we were going to be back in the same division after a season and we were thinking how is how has this happened because we looked so good you looked so poor and now after just one campaign we're probably going to be back in the same division now we will probably be back in the championship however the premier league sorts and whatever happens after the cancellation of fixtures etc but what has happened since that opening two three months where you looked like a really solid league one team well the first thing that's happened is the other teams have kind of got their stuff together and mm. you know that sense of system versus individual i think yeah. our individuals were carried us for the first few months we've got we've got better players than most of most of league one but yeah. there's also your mate paul warren there who totally knows what he's doing at that yeah. level mark robbins at coventry carl robinson um it's a, good, it's a good top six actually isn't it a very strong yeah top six. and but the thing is, Jack, the bottom half is dirge. So okay. what happened was we would go to Rochdale and win 1-0 because we've got better players. We'd Shrewsbury would get a guy sent off and we'd win 3-0. We beat Wimbledon in the last minute. We, I think it's a crazy run. We like won eight out of nine or mm. something. Loads of clean sheets as well. But Ipswich have not beaten any team in, I think it's the top eight all season. Climate. So, yeah, okay. when, when they come up against... And I remember it was actually Rotherham showing up and they had, um, yeah. what's his name, Big Michael Smith up front. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've got a good centre-half called um, Hekwe as well. And I sat Have you heard and... the Paul Warren interview that we did with him, actually? I haven't. No, 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 no. I really So I really on should. that, um, I think his father had just recently passed away and it was that night or evening or day, whatever, of going to Portman Road... And he said, if you lose to Ipswich tonight, you cannot walk back in this change room and look me in the eye. He said, I want one thing from this season, and that is to go out there and beat Ipswich. And he said he put in, his team put in one of the most complete performances. I haven't watched that game. They're excellent. But he, it yeah. meant so much for him that night. Like You know Paul Warren is a, is a massive Norwich fan, season ticket holder, blah, blah, blah. But that night meant so much to him. Yeah, I, and it was one of those occasions. I think they scored their second goal on something like 50 to 60 minutes. And you're, you're doing the same as me vlogging during the game. And I remember saying, because you always hedge your bets so you don't look like a pillock <laughs> afterwards. But I, I sort of said, Tuna Rotherham, confidently, that's game over. That's, that's yeah. done. And then we've seen it. Um, and it's, it's irked Ipswich fans as well. When you see teams like Fleetwood, Joey Barton's Fleetwood actually... Uh, Fairly, I know we're going to talk about Norwich playing against Kevin De Bruyne and whatnot, <laughs> but Joey Barton's Fleetwood, you know, sort of turning up and keeping yeah. the ball better and changing system during the game. And yeah, it's just, um, there just doesn't seem to be um, some set philosophy and set idea of what we were going. Even when you guys were losing under Farker and finishing 14th, I knew what the plan was. I knew, mm-hmm. what, the, I knew what the system was supposed to be. And I, I had an idea of where you were, where you were trying to go and I think I think that's the that's the trouble and um sadly we've yet to be proved that um Lambert's near the caliber he was when he took you guys up 2009 10 10 11 I think those are the right seasons yeah right? sure I mean w- w- you speak about a plan there and for me I mean I can only the, the the only system I know really well is this Daniel Farker Stuart Webber system and it feels like for every Daniel Farker you need that Stuart Webber to implement the system to get recruitment is there the Stuart Webber type character at Ipswich to help Paul Lambert along I'm sure, I'm sure most of the 72 clubs would like a Stuart Webber type character we got uh, we got a chap called Lee O'Neill doing the job look he's not Stuart Webber obviously who's I mean if you look at championship directors of football with the two promotions now he's He's the Brad, number one, yeah. the yeah, number yeah. one guy, isn't he? Really, there's no one, there's no one better. They're trying, trying to do, um, to do that um, director of football thing. There's just always a bit of a sense where Marcus Evans is concerned, where yes. you've got Delia and Michael saying to Stuart Webber, right, go, go do your thing. We trust you. Whereas you've got presumably Lee O'Neill coming back, everything still filtering back through Marcus Evans. So 
how much power does Leo Neal have at Ipswich compared to someone like Stuart Webber? Who Stuart yeah. Webber probably walked into that interview with um, no sense of cockiness going, I just got Huddersfield promoted. Yeah. Huddersfield. Yeah, with yeah. No parachute money. If you give me control, I'll do you a job. But if not, thank you very much. I'm sure there's 10 other clubs that will take me. So um, they're trying to do it, Jack, but I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about the rivalry. But sadly, over the past, what, 10, 15 years, yeah. since Lambert, really, the, that gap has just... Massively. I mean, we, we you spoke earlier, tagline, I had, hadn't actually heard it, PR Paul. <laughs> and I remember the kind of the early days of him managing Ipswich and he was dipping into his own pocket to pay for away travel for fans, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. It feels like, and I mean, I'm only going off Twitter opinion and that's never a good idea, <laughs> but it feels as if the fans have turned on Lambert now. Is there any way that he can save his bacon and, and, and turn this era into a positive one. Don't know. I really don't know. Okay. Um, it's so interesting you say the fans have turned, and I'm just trying to go back before the virus came. And I, I think <laughs> it they, feels a while ago. Yeah, I think they probably probably. I remember going to the because we'd lost uh, going into the virus. I think lost three, four straight games possibly, and yeah. and the home games as well, where where teams are coming. And um, look. You and I, we don't need to tell the listeners, but we know we know what the comments will get if we don't. We know this is not important football compared to the, <laughs> yeah. the virus, but it came at a good time for um, for for Lambert. We've had a p- picture of uh, Jack Lancaster tweeted today. He's now back fit again, so okay. even the squad that comes back might be might be different. But no, there's I, I wouldn't say they turned Jack, but the general sense of suspicion that he's not the guy that took Norwich up and I mean you talk about talk about Villa um you yeah. do a great job but Lerner wanted out for a couple of those a couple of those years and um then I guess at Wolves the uh faux son came in during mm. while he was there and was sort of like mm, we we don't we don't want you we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna yeah, yeah, yeah throw a load of money at this someplace else but um I I don't know if he can do it Jack I I don't know whereas my my hope was 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 great, but um, um, sadly, I'm I'm not sure whether he's whether he's going to be the guy to to do to do it. Okay, I mean, the one thing I can't quite get my head around. I feel like I'm quite good at getting opinions of both sides and trying to understand where the decision came from. The one thing I don't understand is that five year deal that was handed <laughs> to him. Now I know that there's I think there's breakout clauses, right? If you don't go up this season, but even allegedly. S- Allegedly, okay, you hope. Even <laughs> even so, you, you look at that and think, what? How has that come about? I mean, you, you were starting to lose fixtures, fans were starting to turn, and then the manager, who arguably is holding holding the cards, gets handed a, a, a nice monetary five year deal. It's like, how, just talk me through what's gone on there. I don't. I don't know. One thing I'll say about Marcus Evans is generally, the, where players are concerned, generally the contracts are fairly well, fairly well done, and players are guaranteed for an X amount of time, then with an option afterwards. So my only hope is that they'd come to some agreement, and without reading the contract, which I frankly probably wouldn't be able to, <laughs> I'd need my lawyer sister to help me out with that. The only hope can be that he's gone to a more performance related deal like you've suggested so whether they've gone we'll give you a pay rise Mm. but if you don't meet xyz criteria or um evans is very happy with lambert and um we look we know when mccarthy was there that marcus evans was very happy to just sit back and go right this guy knows what he's doing go on run my club Yeah, yeah um he doesn't want to be there He's proven that he's got plenty of other business interests. He doesn't want to be there day on day. And it's, um, allegedly, he's still not there day on day. So uh, w- whether Mr. Lambert, who one thing about Paul Lambert is he's a very, very good talker. Uh, we all he know is. that, don't we? So yeah, he whether um, he's leading Mr. Evans' uh, uh, merry dance, I don't know. But Jack, I'm exactly the same as you. I don't, I don't get it. The contract was three years and. And again, without reading it and knowing what clauses have been put in, no, I, I cannot tell you why a manager with now a relegation and 
you're right, just into that bad run. Mm. Uh, in fact, we just lost 5-3 at, at, Wig, at Lincoln, excuse me. Leaked five goals at, at Lincoln, you know. Um, so, no. It's crazy. Can't tell it's, you. It, I think for me, that w- when I saw that tweet, it was almost you can't kind of breed that negative, not negativity, but it was almost failure. It was starting to fail at that point. And once you reward failure, that's a really kind of negative spiral that you get yourself into. The one other thing I wanted to, to, to touch on, we've talked about Marcus Evans. We all know he's a very shrewd businessman. What the one business that isn't running very well for him at the moment is Ipswich Town. I read a, a, an article on The Athletic a little while back. Now, I forgot on the ins and outs. Simon Hughes. But- I think it was the Simon Hughes one. I think there one, was yeah. a very, a very handsome, long-haired, powerful guy quoted in that. In was that? Oh, sorry, I forget. <laughs> I forgot. Yeah. The the financial reading is pretty grim, isn't it? I mean, talk me. You you know the article better than anyone. You were quoted in it. Yeah. Um, and it's, I mean, what was all that about? Jack, it's a difficult one because Ipswich are fine financially until the second Marcus Evans says. I, I don't want to do this anymore. If at any point Marcus Evans decides to go, nah, not interested anymore, um, Ipswich are screwed. That's right. the that's the truth of it because they obviously owe him an absolute ton of money. It's it's weird when you've got an owner owe, and the club owes their money. Yeah, it's it's kind of just money on paper, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. And unless someone's going to come along and buy the club. So you have a situation where the club owes Marcus Evans 90 million, add 10 million on every year he's he's there. So look, no one in their right mind is going to go to Marcus Evans. I will pay you one pound for Ipswich Town and I will clear your debts. So Ipswich will cost you 91 million. You could yeah. you can buy a championship club for, well, look, you could get Derby who mm. have got a nicer stadium, a more central location and a better squad of players for probably a lot less than that. So the, it's only perilous the second he says, I don't want to do this anymore, in which case, yeah, you could get... Um, well, look at Ellis Short at Sunderland, where yeah. they got relegated into the championship. He said, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to take that parachute money um, and I'm going to cut my losses and you're going to find another buyer and until you do that, and by the way, down you go into League One, etc. Yeah. So if Marcus Evans were to do that, um, Ipswich would likely end up then in in League Two um, okay. without him writing the writing the checks. So it's perilous if he goes. Um, that said, the ridiculous nature of football. If we come back in one month, three months, six months, Ipswich win seven of their last nine games, fluke their way through the playoffs, you're back up in the Championship. Off, off, away we go again. It's it's so it's so on a knife edge. What I will say is, shrewd businessmen don't tend to take ninety million pound losses on stuff. But also, shrewd businessmen know when to fold. Yes, I mean, I suppose that begs the question. After listening to all of that, we know that Marcus Evans isn't the most hands-on owner. What? Why is he doing it? It's <laughs> costing him an absolute shed load of cash every year. To him, probably not that much, but still, mid tens and you know, tens. Ten of million a year. Yeah. Why is he doing it? Well, ob- the, the obvious answer is when he took over in 2010, the ob- um, into the Premier League, take the TV money, have this massive worldwide asset if you're in the, yeah. in the Premier League. Um, but we know the history he gave. And this was at the point when it wasn't 45 million to each of the three relegated teams. When a man of Marcus said, and it wasn't, okay, you can lose 39 million over three years on your FFP so someone like Evans could make a difference there and very very sadly he gave the money to Roy Keane then he gave the money to Paul Jewell who wasted it then he employed yeah. Mick McCarthy who got him into sixth spot without spending on a shoestring yeah yeah on a shoestring and it was like okay this is the way we're going to do it and uh, maybe I was a bit disingenuous Jack it's probably not 10 million a year if I think it's I think it was six to seven million he was writing a check for each year in the championship but okay. obviously, you can cut down the, the TV. There is no TV money in in League One, is there? Is no, he, no, who's, no. Who's watching 
uh, Accrington Stanley versus Ipswich on Sunday. When... I watched it with great joy. <laughs> Accrington are the new crew. In the late yeah. 90s, we always used to lose the crew. Now we always lose to Accrington, yeah. I mean, um, having talked about money, I, I, I don't want to get too in-depth with numbers because I think it sounds quite exciting in your head, but then when you listen back, it's just <laughs> talking about kind of spreadsheets. But, you know, um, so Kieran Maguire, the price of football, always puts out some really great stuff regarding football finance. And it came out today, I believe. I mean, I've, I've only seen it today. The wages of last season's championship teams. And Norwich City's average wage, having won the Premier League, um, won the Premier League, I wish, having won the championship was £23,795. So that's averaged across the squad. Ipswich Towns was 8,000, so a third. Aston Villa, of course, went up through the playoffs, was 44,150 <laughs> pounds. When I saw that, I knew it was going to be high, not that. Oh my God. That's an average wage as well, which is bonkers. Now, I think it's worth saying that these numbers are post bonuses. So Norwich City wouldn't have been that high if we hadn't have got promoted. And we weren't probably chasing that promotion as hard as their numbers maybe show. But you, I think you've had a bit of back and forth with Norwich fans <laughs> on Twitter today. Your argument was, you, and to be fair, you've always stuck with the line of, I don't think Norwich fans quite know how much money their club has in terms of a championship club. Nailed it, Jack. Yeah, that yeah. kind of proves it, doesn't it? It does. Um, so look, um, and I say this uh, coming from a position of great respect for Norwich and for what they've done. Norwich in championship terms are a financial colossus compared to uh, Rotherham, Millwall, clubs of that nature. Yes, I take the argument that Norwich spent themselves into a utterly precarious position. And we go with Naismith, Oliveira, all those huge contracts of players that didn't work. The contention I've had and where I've picked on Norwich fans a little bit on Twitter is at the back end of last season I'm constantly seeing oh this Norwich team cost no money you know, remember when Closer came out of the team yeah, and yeah, all of a sudden like you, could, a few you could come up with this statistic where everybody was free and I was I was sitting there banging my head against the wall because I was like Norwich fans what do you want here your team is brilliant. Look at them. Yeah. yeah? They, 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 what, they get 94 points or something? It was something like that, yeah. The guys were incredible last season and worthy, worthy champions. Best team in the league and the table really doesn't lie on that. And there was just this sense that the Norwich fans were still trying to argue with me that they were some kind of financial heroes. <laughs> and I'm like, no, you're not. This is, this is Tim Closer costs 10 million. And you've, the club that paid Gary Naismith 50 grand a week for however many years um yes Stuart Weber has inherited an absolute crap show of contracts and then yeah. done this amazing job and yes Madison and Murphy gave the equivalent of parachute pants all my argument to Norwich fans was is that if I were a Norwich fan I would very proudly say um that Norwich is not owned by a rich individual and Norwich have managed for the last 10 years through a few brilliant promotions mm. to either have Premier League TV money, parachute yes. money, and the one year they didn't have that, they had the best English central midfielder um, in at that level in the country yeah. playing for them, who they sold to kind of fill the hole. All my contention to Norwich fans is, is are you a big club? Or are you a little club? And it's like they're right slap bang in the middle of in both. Middle. And, don't be a don't be a little club when it suits you and be a big club <laughs> when it suits you. Do you know what I mean? That's Norwich in championship terms, financially, okay, they're not Aston Villa and they're not yeah. Newcastle um, or, or Leeds, in fact, with the commercial revenue. Yes, yeah, yeah. But Norwich in championship terms compared to a, a Rotherham, for example, if Norwich played Rotherham and I'd have to look at the squads and had Tim Closer and Jordan Rhodes on the bench... I would suspect those two players' wages would pay for the entire Rotherham team. Yeah, I mean, it's worth... So, Rotherham are on this list, of course. Their average weekly wage... Their average weekly wage was £3,600 compared to our... You wouldn't get out of bed for that, would you, Jack? (laughs) (laughs) I might just do a podcast for you and call it it a day there. But, no, it's fascinating reading. I think me and Ben have both both retweeted that. So, it's over on our Twitter just to have a look at 
the uh, at, at the finances. I think it's probably a nice time now to get onto a few Twitter questions, Ben. Let's do it. Um, so I tweeted out earlier. I haven't gone through these before, which is <laughs> oh, always, always risky. Always risky. Um, okay, let's go to um, <laughs> John Hipkiss. How does he plan to keep his flowing locks in order during lockdown with no hairdressers to visit? Um, I have a haircut that will survive three months <laughs> without being cut. The thing with long hair is once it gets past about there, no one notices whether it's there. It's people <laughs> like yourself, Jack, who wear your hair short. Where... Well, it's, yeah, I'm not, I'm, I mean, I've never had a skin fade, which is all the rage at the moment, <laughs> but it is kind of growing outwards. I've never seen this before with my hair. It's not growing long. It's just growing wide, which is a slight worry. Um, um, anyway. But that's the least of my worries. And I do have my... <laughs> My hairdresser, Daryl, I do have on Instagram, so I can possibly, um, no, I, I would not break protocol to <laughs> sneak out for an unessential haircut, but no, least of my worries. Good stuff. Okay, um, let's get to, okay, I think you've probably a fairly generic question, but you have tried, how many of the 92 grounds have you done now? Oh, of the 92, because I'm so old, Jack, um, a lot of them, I went to original Arsenal yeah, yeah. and original Man City and then. We'll count them. My team never got into the Premier League for the next <laughs> 20 years. So um, 50 or 60, I okay. guess. So the question here is, other than Portland Road, what's your favourite ground that you visited? Um, Villa Park. Something special okay. about Villa Park. Really love going there. And the favourite ever is is Main Road. Um, there's a couple of games there. I saw Ipswich win there in um, 98, 99 in the last minute under the lights. I saw Ipswich lose there, but there was just something electric about about main road i think and and you also you'd park your car up and you'd have to give some scally man kid five quid to not put dents <laughs> in the side or whatever so yeah main road i think okay good stuff um rory now we haven't really touched on what happens the rest of the season he says do you think there will be a deadline for the season to finish now we've probably done all we've read every theory of how this season could possibly be finished from world cup styles in the, you know, the arse and the nowhere to playing in the Midlands and sorting it. How do you see this season finishing? I suppose it's very different for, for a League One club compared to, you know, a, a Liverpool or maybe not Liverpool, but a, a rich Premier League club. Because on one hand, you've got Liverpool, they might not win the Premier League, but they're going to be able to keep all of their staff in jobs and keep their players. For a club in League Two, maybe... It's a situation of will the club still be around if if this season doesn't finish? So, do you see this season finish as one? I guess is the question. And, and two, if you do, then how will it finish? Well, and we should preface this by saying we're on a Norwich City channel, and the one, the golden position in the whole of this is twentieth in the Premier League, where Norwich are sat, and there is no team in world football that would have more to gain um, than a team that would be relegated from the Premier League and get to stay in there for another year, just in terms of that of that yeah. huge drop down. Now, that was my opinion a few a few um, weeks ago. Surely we want this season to be sort of null and void to survive in the Premier League, when in actual fact, in terms of financial gain, we would be better off having the season finish and being relegated because then the TV revenue still comes through. It gets paid as normal. There's risk of hundreds of million pounds not being paid up from Sky, BT, all of the rights holders, which then therefore means that clubs don't get the parachute payments, TV money. Financially, we would probably be worse off if we were to stay in the Premier League, which is bonkers, really. Depend I, I, yeah, depending on how they, how they decide to sort it out. Yes. If I'm... If I'm Norwich, though, and I've been, I don't know, I've been promised X amount of TV money, I damn well want my TV money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you know what yeah. I mean? That's that's the long and the short of it. Also, if I'm an advertiser and I'm paying to advertise, I want my advert on Norwich versus Manchester United in the in the bit just before it kicks off and yeah. Martin Tyler says, and it's live or whatever. <laughs> so, um, look, it's, it's a nightmare, isn't it? It's a nightmare for everybody that I, I think we all understand the one thing you can't do is do any arbitrary i mean you've got aston villa haven't you you cannot relegate aston villa norwich or who else in the bottom three uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I don't know who else i can't there. even remember what football really look feels like let me, let me have a quick look while you talk you cannot relegate 
a team or give a team a title or a promotion or a demotion without finishing the thing. We all we all understand that. So especially with someone like Villa who've got a game in hand. Yeah, it's or, yeah or Norwich yeah. could say, well, if we win three games out of five and draw one, yeah. we, we might be out of it. So you can't you can't for someone like Norwich, you can't relegate them without finishing it. Um mm. I don't care when they finish it as long as they finish it i think is my thing okay. and like you were saying you know i don't know shut down shut down wembley put bases in the hotels and <laughs> have one team go in at uh or two teams going for a game at 12 o'clock and broadcast all of it or whatever what i do know is the the premier league is kind of the the start of the waterfall for everything so it is the most important get the premier league going get something moving again yeah um, I don't know how they're going to do it. I I think like you just said voiding it. Well, yeah, what do you do what do you do do you pay Fulham, um Cardiff and Huddersfield another 45 million yeah. quid year one parachute money and distort that league even more? I know. <laughs> um, it's I, such a legal yeah. minefield more than anything, isn't it? And yeah, it's and as we all know, football clubs like to spend kind of a season ahead, don't they? So yeah. they would have spent money they haven't got. So if that money then isn't paid to them, then they're in a whole, you know, an absolute load of trouble then. Well, and I mean, this is the one good thing, I guess, from a Norwich point of view, is that you're in a plan and you're in a system and you didn't. I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about Norwich's Premier League kind of approach this season, but yeah. there wasn't. There wasn't a big spend this season. We've seen the end of those huge contracts. And I think the it seems obvious to everybody that the plan is to be sustainable over three to five years. And um, honestly, if if we hadn't had the virus and you did come down and you kept two of Aaron's Pookie and Buendia and Farker, why, why wouldn't Norwich score another 95 points in the championship? Yeah, collect the forty-five million and be, be, be straight back up. I, the, the risk for me, if I was, um, if I was a Norwich fan, is the output of those three players. And yes. even though the team was incredible, sometimes you don't know how important one player is. It's, it's probably Buendia even more than Puki, isn't it? Um, yeah. But you just, you just never know that. Okay, you get. I don't know what twenty five million for Pookie and sign another fifteen million quid. You just don't know whether whether he was the guy that made that team tick or you don't know, do you? So although you would think if Norwich did come down with parachute money and the majority of the twenty eighteen nineteen squad, you'd think it would be a fairly straightforward promotion with the same management team and most of those most of those Sounds players. so simple, doesn't it? It does. But I mean, <laughs> uh, look, we've just done a load of stuff on on the Ipswich podcast, 99-2000. And there was the Charlton example where they did exactly that. They went up, they kept 90% of the of the team. Mm. And, and they, th- there was one point they won 12 games on the trot that season and just went straight, went straight back through. And it, it, I mean, I don't know what your thoughts are. I, I just identify that right-hand side of Aaron's, Buendia and Puki. And if you do go down, you'd, how many of those go and how hard, even with all the money that's going to come for them, how hard is it to replace the output that those players gave in that system? Yeah, massively. I think you probably lose Max, you lose Jamal on the other side, you lose Ben Godfrey from the middle. So that's the core of your defence ripped out. Buendia definitely goes. I think he definitely goes whether we stay up or go down. Pookie would probably stay. Um, Campwell goes, who's had an extraordinary season out of... I'm Nowhere, so su- really. Jack, yeah, I'm me so too. Surprised. Me too. I looked at I looked at uh, Godfrey, Aaron's, Campwell, and um, Lewis, and I had Campwell fourth out of <laughs> yeah, out yeah. Of those I players. Mean, it's great because Todd obviously he kind of had his breakthrough season last season, scored his first goal against Rotherham, but he was never convincing. I don't think he had a few really nice performances. One at Nottingham Forest away sticks out. Um, but he was always battling with with Buendia for a spot. And there was a real key moment in the season. It came later on when Norwich were like there or thereabouts of promotion and we were like, can we get automatics? It was still very much up in the air. Buendia gets suspended 
Campwell comes in the side, doesn't have his best few games, and the fans start to turn on him. Um, and we had Campwell on the on on the podcast at the end of the season. We were up, it was all good. And he hadn't signed a new contract at that point. And I think there was doubt that he might not re-sign. He had an agent he was maybe pushing um, for, for, for a nice move somewhere. And I didn't think Todd would make that step up. He's quite small. He's quite you know slender. He's not the biggest of chaps. And you look at someone in that position and think, you need a bit more about you. And because he hadn't set the championship on fire, you doubted whether that would be the case. But he had so much self-belief. Like he would look you in the eye and tell you that he was getting in that Norwich Premier League team and he would shine. And like you, I didn't expect him to be having the season. But arguably, he's been better than Buendia. I mean, Buendia hasn't quite stepped up as much as some would have hoped. He's been fantastic, but he hasn't got the gold. Stieperman, who was so crucial to the way we played last season, hasn't stepped up, has hardly played football. So it's been Cantwell and he's and he's rose to the occasion really well. But it, yeah, it's fascinating. I had him down the exact same as you, Max. Um, I thought he was going on loan, Jack, to Championship. I yeah. thought he'd be at Derby or something. You know, Derby took Kieran Dowell or yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah. I thought they'd take... I thought they'd take um, Cam. It does speak well for the standard of training at Norwich, though. If um, yes. Cantwell can do... He's obviously a good trainer and, um, yeah, he's Massively. very, I mean, very surprised that he's been so Going good. back to the start of this, so summer, you know, we go up as champions. Did you expect us to approach that transfer window with a bit more gusto? No, I think okay. I think I expected it to go how it went. I, I Kind of the analogy I'd lose is if, if I drive down that road out there at 80 and I smash my car up, the next time I drive down that road, even though the limit's 70... I might just go 50 because <laughs> I've got some bad memories of the last time I, I, yeah, drove, yeah. I drove down it. Look, you you were way ahead of the, the plan in even going up in the first place. Yeah. I think, judging by what Kieran has tweeted today and the figures, there's, there's, there was still a long tail of um, of liabilities on, on payments that need to be kind of cleared yeah. off. And um, uh, Stuart Weber did an interview with... Um, Paddy Davitt that I I listened to after you guys went up and he he said as much he said we look we can't do we can't do Jordan Rhodes at thirty grand a week or whatever we we're, we're not gonna it would be irresponsible um and I I think um I sometimes see Norwich fans say oh we need to give it more a go we need to give it more a go hundred million TV money we could at least you know even a, a expensive loan player or what have you and no liability going onwards but I. I think if you come down with a load of cash in the bank, a load yeah. of even, and now you say another huge asset in Campwell potentially yeah. to to bank, and the the big caveat is that the the team or the most important players or the soul or the um, the intangible part of the team gets gets ripped up. I think there's no reason why it's very stable. You know, you're going to sell loads of season tickets anyway, aren't you? Yeah, you should have a good season and. You get back in there and then you've got to it's then's the time where right we add and it's going to be a yeah, club yeah. record what is your club record signing um and Bukhani? no he was only on loan i think it's still Close still so? ricky no it's still ricky van wolfswink i think wow um, um, but eight and a half million yeah yeah it'll be a it'll be a club record signing and then yeah you know going back through but no i th- i think I think you've got to be a bit sort of pragmatic about it if you're Weber or and say, look, okay, you know, he's not going to sign Gary Naismith on fifty grand a week for ten years or whatever, whatever happened or Oliveira or what have you. But no, I I kind of understood why why they did that, and I I, I think possibly it was you who said on one of the things, give the players that got there at least yeah. give them a go, at least give them yeah. until. January and and this is a weird thing about from what I've seen Norwich in the Premier League is that for l- lots of parts of the games they look absolutely fine. Yeah, you know, I know. convincing just, as well. Yeah, just the bit of the bit of quality or the bit of experience that you know maybe the players will gradually gradually get and you know it would be okay still. And what I do admire is exactly the same thing. I see the centre halves taking the ball. I see. Um, because pretty much <laughs> Norwich is, is hilarious. All out attack in 2018-19, wasn't it? Yeah. Just attack every player yeah, comfortable yeah. on the ball. Go, go, go! And I, I do, I do admire, I do admire that. And 
Um, yeah, so I, I, I wouldn't. I, I can see why Norwich fans are like, oh, go on, sign somebody, sign somebody. But tell me who, tell me how much for, and where where they go in the team, and which of those players they would displace. Definitely. You know, I think the, the really frustrating thing for me this season is. I had kind of resigned us to, to relegation after we lost to Aston Villa at home. I think it was 5-1 or something. We got absolutely mauled that day. We had something like 10 injuries. It was a couple of games after the Man City win. And I kind of said, I, I looked at the team and I said, we, we're very close to being good enough, but we're not quite there. And the thing that I, I think helped us so much in that championship promotion was naivety. We were young a lot of the players hadn't had that championship experience, but we had the quality and the opposition maybe wasn't quite as good. So you could get away with chucking 10 men in in the other half's opposition and hoping you'll score goals. And we did score goals. We also conceded a lot of goals and we gave up a lot of chances and a lot of them chances weren't converted. This season, we've probably given up less chances, (laughs) but the opposition's strike force is so much better. So it's that naivety helped us last season, hasn't helped us this season. But I've still really enjoyed this season. It's like, it's not just, you don't support a football club to just have that 90 minutes on a Saturday. It's all about what's the club trying to do. I think Stuart Webb is a big believer in leaving a legacy. And he said many a time that he will leave after this current contract is up. So he's got a couple more years and then he'll be off to go on to his next challenge. So he knows that he wants to leave Norwich in a financially stronger, positionally stronger position than what we were when he joined. And I think we will go down. Whatever happens, this whole you know coronavirus is throwing everything up in the air. But like you, we would go down financially strong with a fairly decent core squad, still selling 22,000 season tickets, which gives you that opportunity to go straight back up. And there is that clear division now, isn't there, between the Premier League bottom three and the Championship top four and then the rest. We can't go into the top 10, probably, of the Premier League. We don't have enough cash. But we're probably never going to dip too much lower than sixth seventh in the championship at the moment because there's there's such a financial kind of difference isn't there i look at it as you have your champions league teams and there's about yeah. four or five of them who are different different level and then commercially all around the world so they're yeah. in their own league and then i see it as premier league tv teams so they're the next grade and then moneyed championship teams so mm. ones like norwich with either assets to sell or parachute money and yeah. that's the thing Norwich have done well is for a decade they've been in that third bracket so Champions League Premier League or moneyed yes. championship I think that's what they've done really really well and and like you say if Weber's playing playing the long game he, he doesn't want to finish on a relegation from the Premier League does he or a I don't no. know middling middling championship team but it, it, it's very very interesting and I I all I would always say is just look back to what Ipswich 12th, Leeds 13th, Norwich 14th at the end of that season. Mm, yeah. Ta- tackle goes in on Madison at Sheffield yeah. Wednesday, one inch to the other side and you don't sell Madison. Yeah. And I hate to say it, look at Middlesbrough now where yes. parachute money ran out. You'd sell your Ben Gibson and your Adama Traore and whoever and it's hard you know even with steve gibson as your owner it's it's hard so i just think norwich fans should probably look at it and think well look look what you could have won (laughs) you know and um and it's 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 not so bad is it you know it's not promotions in 10 years or whatever it's been hey (laughs) it's certainly been exciting the one team we haven't touched on i know we've both watched a lot of them over the past couple of seasons it kind of chucks all the theories about the Premier League hierarchy up in the area, Sheffield United and and what they've done. Similar kind of path to us up from League One through the Championship into the Premier League. And and for a moment, it looked like they had a chance of getting into the top four. That's probably not going to happen now. But we kind of saw it through the Championship, didn't we? We, For me, they were the best team to come to Carroll Road. Even when Leeds beat us 3-0, Sheffield United looked a lot more compact. They had that energy. They they just had something about them. And Chris Wilder's the type of manager that you hate so much that you'd love <laughs> him to be yours. He's because a he just, manager, yeah. Yeah, he is excellent. And 
Have you been surprised to see them go on to such such dizzy little, heights this season? A little bit, yeah, a little bit. I always think about championship teams going into the Premier League of how set are you in your system, um, you know, yeah. and... I have to use the Ipswich example because obviously we spent four years losing in the playoffs every year, but basically winning 60% of our games every year. So we had a very good team that didn't get promoted and obviously year on year improved it. In we went and finished fifth. Um, And what I would not like Sheffield United to do now is what we did where all of a sudden you go, right, now we need to take it to the next level. And here comes Finidi George and Matteo Sereni on 10 times more (laughs) money than everybody else so that's what I'd not like to see it's a a bit weird actually because um, Leeds and Norwich were probably better football teams weren't they um, last season yeah Um, and played that really continental style whereas Sheffield United had the English grit as well didn't they you know they could could dig in and defend they still played some lovely football as well they did yeah and they this obviously very innovative overloading thing that we've all heard um sick to death many times (laughs) sick to death of hearing it now because we all like you we all saw this for two years before all these premier league pundits did but no i'm i'm very surprised that they've gone as high as they did honestly i I looked at it and you obviously you have this thought as an ipswich fan of God, what if Norwich do what we did when we went up? You know, really good side, nice and settled. <laughs> what if they finish sick for something? Like that? I would never, <laughs> ever hear it. So in my head, I was like, well, Norwich have changed nothing. They've got a very yeah. good team. Um, but I think you've hit the nail on the head where the style that Sheffield United have, where they're able to do 20 minutes without the ball, has yes. suited them better in the Premier League, seemingly. than Because I, I went to the Norwich-Sheffield United game, and I thought you were... Oh, I've said Premier League and Syria's decided it wants to tell me there's no... no I went to Norwich Sheffield United, Jack, sorry. And that was one where you could have been a couple up at half-time yeah. and you were yeah, leaving yeah, yeah. at half-time. And it just it just felt like Sheffield United could weather your storm for longer than you could weather weather their storm. And Absolutely. like you say, maybe people like Godfrey, he's only played 40, 50 championship games in his life and he's against exactly. Aguero and you know these <laughs> these people. And it's like... Well, of course he's gonna, you know, have a few difficult games. But no, I have I have been surprised by Sheffield United. I've I I don't know who I thought would finish higher out of the three of you. It was not, not much. Well, Sheffield team. United, according to the bookies, they were basically odds on to go. Well, they were odds on to go down this season. Yeah. So they were the favourites to go down. Um, yeah, it's I I thought they were going to have a good season. I thought we were going to have an okay season. I must admit, I think that patch. I didn't think you would be bottom, Jack. Honestly. No, I I think that what really killed us was that period of about a month, six weeks, where we had so many injuries. And I'm look, most teams have injuries throughout the squad, and there have been, you know, Bournemouth have had the same, but we had it really bad. And I don't want to kind of, I don't think we've been good enough this season. I think we would have gone down anyway. But that point. We'd won a couple of games. We'd beat Newcastle, beat them convincingly. We'd beat Man City. And then to get Zimmerman out, Closers out, we, there was literally the whole core of our squad had been ripped apart. So that was really unfortunate. Um, but it's been a, it's been a good season. Um, we're approaching an hour now. Have we got anything else to add? Any, any, I guess, I, I tell you what, my question here, we might catch up again in a year's time. Who knows? Hopefully it'll be sooner. Where are Ipswich Town in a year? Well, hopefully, in a year's time, um, I can't say hope. I can say hopefully Ipswich will be very high up in League One. And you would think um, Norwich would be in the at, at the top two or at least the top three of the championship um, somewhere, g- given all the caveats we've said about Farker, Weber, Buendia, Aarons and Pukki. Jack, I don't care if Ipswich are not even in the top six in League One. I need to see... a bloody plan i need to, i need to know what's happening what, who the team's built around and and where it's going rather than because you had this nightmarish thought earlier in the season um we are going to go up and we're going to go into the championship and we're going to be the worst team the championship is i'd rather not go up and you'll come down and we'll lose another two games to <laughs> bloody Norris, won't we? sounds great <laughs> sounds awful do you know what i mean i'd i'd rather they build and it sounds rather selfish given we have got a cash rich owner we're not one of the teams at risk in in league one obviously it's not nice for him it's costing him a millions and millions he's of got pounds, he's got but, enough 
he has a lot. He yeah. has a lot. I don't know whether he has enough, um, or well, whether he chooses to spend enough. But you would hope that um, for both, and we we always come at our podcast from a position of respect, don't we, Jack? You would hope do, for yeah. you would hope for both teams that Norwich would be in their plan without having the guts of their team ripped out and nicely stable in the bank. Lots of people at the stadium hopefully build up that bloody tiny stand as well. And, know, you know, know, that's the, that's the key to, you know, get start, you need 30 to 40,000 in there to be a regular. That, would be, club. that would be Weber's legacy. Even if we're in league two, just finish this, just get a stand <laughs> up there. Exactly, you want yeah. nothing else to it. Sell the squad. <laughs> but I would hope that Ipswich are on the up, up climb of a plan. And it just, just not, I think they're just hoping to barge through some kind of promotion and then, and then work from there, which given the examples of Sheffield United and Norwich and Brentford and Bristol City and your old mate, Alex Neil, who you were right about as well, actually at Preston. Um, it's no, it needs a, needs more thought and more intelligence than um, the old Brian Clough. I know Brian Clough's a genius, but I can get together a squad and win the European Cup. It, you can't do it anymore. Do you know no, what I mean? it's, um, it's fascinating. I just love how jealous you are of Stuart Webber. That makes me really happy. <laughs> he's uh, amazing, he's, isn't he? He's, he's a top man. I'm yeah. going to really where miss do, him. Where do, you think he'll, where do you think he'll go? And do you think if um, think the Manchester United thing did open up that he'd be able to turn it down? Um, yeah, I do, actually. <laughs> I think I think he could turn it. You know, I, think he, I think the next step for him, I mean... Heard of, you know, I've listened to him speak for hours and hours on end. I think it's going to be a, a, a Dortmund or a, or a club like that, you know, something with a real culture about them, a project. I think he's quite keen on on moving. How old is you he? Know, out, uh, he's still young, I think. Um, early 40s, I think. Yeah. Complete guess. Might have, might have over, overshot that. I'm not sure. But um yeah, it's he's he is very very good. To be fair, if we we need to you know balance this out, the recruitment this season hasn't been good enough. The loan deals have been incredibly poor. Um, I, think there, I think there was a bit of credit built up from last year's recruitment though. Yeah, there? exactly, exactly. But you know, in the Premier League, has he got the recruitment right? Probably not. So just, an- just answer me this as well, Jack. Are do Farker and Weber now go as a pair wherever? Weber goes next. That's it. Um, that's really interesting. I Whatever you say about yeah. Weber, Jack, the way that that team played was yeah. down to Farker, it and they was. were and they were brilliant. It was, um, and all of the players give masses of credit to Farker in terms of off the pitch as well, and the way he trains and everything. I don't think they do go as a pair. Um, I think there'll be a, a load of mutual respect, but I think Weber's, you know, clever enough to pick out another. 10 Daniel Farkas if he needs to. Really? Um, and I think if he was to go to a club, he wouldn't just want to replicate what he's tried at Norwich City on maybe on a bigger budget. I think he'd need to, you know, headhunt someone who really fits another club. Um, so, no, I don't think they do, but it'd be marvellous if if, um, if they do go as a pair. That'd be, be good fun. Interesting. Yeah, anyway, um, anything coming up? What, what, what content are you filming at the moment with oh. no, no God, football to talk about? About. I'm trying my best, so um, tough, it? there's nothing, there's nothing, to, nothing to talk about. So I'm doing sort of championship stuff and some live streams yeah. and some top tens, and obviously at this point, I'd like to say hello to all the Norwich fans who have kept subscribing and maybe see you again next season. So don't un, <laughs> don't unsubscribe. And as always, we come from a position of respect, and it doesn't matter that I'm waving this Ipswich scarf up here. Um, okay, Always, yeah, always respect for um, for every club, really. Every that's club is great to its supporters, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? It's... That's why I always love you getting on and, and watching your stuff. And I know a lot of Norwich fans watch your stuff, and I'm sure they're very vocal. And apologies it's... to the ones I've been winding up on Twitter. To stay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, mate, thank you so much. Stay My safe. My pleasure, Jack. Um, uh, let, let's do more of these Absolutely. over the coming months, because I don't think there's going to be much football for, for a little while. So head over to, to Ben's channel. I'll link that in the description. Um, subscribe, say hello, and uh, we'll see you for another TNC podcast very soon. Bye-bye.